Yeah, I mean, part of it, part of being a storyteller, I would say it's within the family, right? You know, so, um, you know, my father, Goewa Diongo, is a writer. Um, three of my other siblings, actually four of them, are also writers. Um, so actually we also consider ourselves as a, as a, as a, just as a, as a family of writers. But um, my grandmother would, would sit us down, you know, the, the stereotypical, the stereotypical uh, view of Africans where you're sitting around and, and hearing stories, right? So she would sit us down and tell her stories when we were growing up. Uh, and, then, um, and then my aunt as well, you know, so yeah, so, so I've, I've just been surrounded by stories. Um, when my father was forced into political exile, I would, I would also spend a lot of time in his office, you know, because he just left abruptly, right? Uh, I spent a lot of time in his office uh, reading books as well. So yeah, I, I, would, I mean, I, I would say like my whole life really <laughs> uh, has been around uh, storytellers and storytelling. Yeah, no, I, I, personally, I don't believe in the idea of a universal writer, right? I, I, I think people use the idea of universal writing as a way of abstracting the politics and so on and so forth. Um, my, my being, my being Gekoyo, my being Kenyan, my being African, all those things define the work I do, right? Um, right now, I'm writing a book on, um, I'm calling it somewhere in between African and African American, you know, so it's, it's all about blackness, right? And uh, questions, of, of course, questions of race, but also questions of, um, you know, around slavery and so on and so forth. If, if we, 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 we write from our DNA, right? We, yeah, so I, I believe in writing from my DNA, which in this case would be, would be African. But there, there's a side question, though, which is, what, what does it mean to be African? What does it mean to be Gekoyo? Um, so I took a DNA test some time back, I think two or three years ago, you know, and it turns out from my DNA, you know, I have, uh, you know, blood from South Africa, you know, uh, from Eritrea, from Ethiopia, from Somalia, and so on and so forth, right? You know, so, you know, <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so in, in, in a way we already, even, even as, as, as African as I am, I'm, I'm also very mixed. Yeah, so I, my, my, myself, I believe in, in, in writing beautifully. Like, I, I want to create beautiful work. Um, but I also don't believe in abstracting the politics, right? So I think the role of a writer is actually revealing the contradictions of our, of our existence. In, in, the, in the African case, there are some things that just don't make any sense that I think as writers we have to deal with. For example, um, you know, people... Um, voting, in, it, in this case in Kenya, uh, voting for a president who owns uh, or whose family owns 565,000 acres of land, and yet the, the people voting for him uh, will kill each other, you know, over land and so on and so forth, right? Um, at some point, it was illegal to dream of the president's death. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, the way I think about it, like, what's the difference in, in terms of me writing today as opposed to writing in the 1960s uh, or 1970s? Um, and and, and part, of, part of it would be that I grew up in a world that didn't, that, that didn't have any coherence. Where else for, you know, for, for, let's say, my father and so on and so forth, even within the colonialism, there was a coherence of colonizer are colonized, right? Yeah, but, but, but growing up in an independent country that's devolving into chaos and into a dictatorship um, with, with, yeah, with, with those, sort of, those sort of weird, um, you can't dream of the president's death. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I think part of, part of the work is doing that. Um, but I do love the idea of also giving to African beauty, the idea of beauty, right? So with my latest novel, uh, Unburied Dead with Song, right? It, it, it's, I, I think it's mostly, well, I think so anyway for myself, right? <laughs> I, I think it's mostly about beauty, like just wanting to, to contribute to this stream, to this beautiful river of, uh, to this beautiful river of, of, of beauty.
Yeah, so yeah, so the, 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 the tizita is a form of music from uh, from Ethiopia. Uh, it's more it's, when it's described in popular media, it's described as a you know as Ethiopian blues, right? Um, but 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 it, but I think it's more than that. I, I I think for me, the tizita is music about life, but not just life today, but the totality, right? So I, I, I think if you come across a good tizita, you can hear echoes of, of the past uh, in ways that you don't hear in pop music. It's also about our containment, right? You know, so where else if you are, if, you know, music is about explosion. Most of the music is about explosion and, and, and to my mind showing off, you know, showing off your range and so on and so forth. But, 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 but the tizita does it the other way around, right? Uh, so the, the, the way I think of it is, um, is it's almost like a sonnet. It, it's this very contained, um, and, and the, yeah. So as, as opposed to explosion, it's implosion, right? It's it's from it, yeah. It's 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 from the inside, right? And if yeah, and, and if, if if you enter that world, it's just it's very very beautiful space. Um, but in 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 my case, I had my first visitor. You know, and in the novel, I, 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 one of the characters says this, that if you hear your first visitor, like you just fall in love, it's like falling in love, you don't forget that moment. Uh, I had my first visitor in uh, 2001, uh, when, I, when I was at Boston University. No, actually, it's 2000, yeah, when I was at Boston University. And, um, you know, and then consequently, I couldn't find it, you know, because, you know, well, I'm Kenyan. <laughs> you know, I, for many years, I couldn't find it, and I kept looking. Um, but eventually, I, I got to find the music again. Uh, but I just want to read a, a short, um, a short passage. So, in the novel, you have uh, you have four musicians who are competing to see who can sing the best tizita, right? Um, then, then you have the main character, Manfredi, you know, who is the narrator, who is a tabloid journalist. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, it, I'm just gonna read this short scene where then he gets to witness this competition that that also doesn't take place, but it does, <laughs> right? Um, where, where, where one of the main characters, and her name is uh, Miriam, uh, is explaining or, or is reading aloud or is or, or singing uh, the Tizita. When I dream of happy days, O oh, Tizita, wake me so I can find you once again. I fear so much that you too will leave me and I'll forget this pain that carries my love. And Tizita, if I forget those I loved, how can I remember who I am? One day I'll be dead and gone, my grave untended, dead of birth and death on my gravestone from centuries past. And only my Tizita will remain. Only you will remain. Tizita, what I fear the most is that I'll forget this pain that carries my love. So, 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 so that, that, that sort of captures the Tizita in terms of, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's a question of, of not, not wanting to mourn, right? Or, or, yeah, no, 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 not wanting to mourn. Uh, because if, if, you, if, if you mourn and then you heal, then you forget you know, the person that you loved, then you forget all that history, right? So it, it's, yeah, it, it's saying I don't want to forget, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah, remembering and what we leave behind, right? It, for me, it's a question of remembering and what we leave behind. When I was writing the novel, there's a, there's a passage. Um, when I was writing the novel, uh, I was living in this apartment, and behind it, there was a graveyard, right? There was a graveyard, and... Um, but it, it wasn't for recent deaths, right? It, it was a graveyard where it was mostly people who died, I don't know, 1700s, 1800s, and so on and so forth. You know, and, and, and part of writing the novel was the realization that, if, yeah, eventually we end up in these unmarked graves. Like, it, like it's, it's inevitable. It's, inev it's inevitable that that's how we'll all end up. So then what, what, what does it mean we are here? Right, and how do we, and how do we, in this case through storytelling, continue on? Right. Um, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so, so, so yeah, just, just, just walking around and being in the graveyard and just looking at these stones, you know, and realizing that's how, you know, it's inevitable. Um, so yeah, what would I like, what, what, what would I like, like to leave behind? You know, and I, I think for me that's leaving behind good stories. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm the co-founder of the Mabati Cornell Kiswahili Prize for African Writing. Uh, so it's a prize that you know that awards a, a, a total of fifteen thousand dollars to three or four winners uh, for writing in Kiswahili. Um, but the reason of doing that, as opposed to studying an English prize, was the realization of, of just how um, how deprived African languages are. Uh, if you consider Kiswahili is a language spoken by um, over 200 million people, right, across, across, um, across five countries, or more actually for that matter, right? Uh, that's also taught in the US. And I don't know, like you find Kiswahili everywhere. But considering this is a language spoken by 200 million people, and yet I think we are the only prize, right? We are the only li literary prize for this language. Um, it, 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 does, it, it does give you pause, right? Uh, if you consider there are over 2,000 African languages, right? And most of them won't have journals, won't have literary praises, won't have, uh, in fact, not, not even taught, and so on and so forth. If you consider all that, um, and, 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 and then, of course, if you consider the importance of languages, like we are language, right? We are, we are languages. Uh, then, then for me, it became important then to to be involved with um, um, with, with studying the Kiswahili praise. I'm trying to translate my first novel, uh, Nairobi Heat, into Gekoyo. Um, but but so, but so, but also my father, I mentioned him earlier, Gugwa uh, Diongo. Um, he just finished translating the river between. He just finished the first draft of translating the river between into Gekoyo. And it's been interesting listening to him, you know, through the process, you know, the, just, just, just the excitement, just the excitement of, of seeing his young novel, right? You know, because he wrote it, I think, when he was in his 20s. Uh, yeah, and wrote it in English before eventually he moved to writing in, a, in, in, in African languages in Gekoyo. Yeah, but it's just been fascinating listening to him, the excitement of, it's almost like he can hear the novel ag ag again, right? Yeah. Anyway, all, anyway all, all that to say, <laughs> all that to say that uh, that I think our real originality and innovation will be in uh, in African languages. Yeah, I know. Yeah, which is terrible because I, I consider myself a poet. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I, I, I do consider myself primarily a poet, right? And but now, so do, like, if, if, if I look at even my crime fiction, uh, one of the main characters, Muddy, uh, is a poet. Right. Even this digital novel, there is poetry in, in, in terms of all the music you read in this novel. It's, it's a poet writing it, right? Uh, but then, of course, I also have now my, you know, poetry books. Um, but the way I've tried to explain that to myself is to think of the poetry helping me ask questions that I don't have answers for, right? And, 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 and the one thing... I, it's it's almost like it's almost like like trying to um, to give life to the incomprehensible, right? So, for for me for me the thing the thing that comes to mind always is let's say the Rwandan genocide, right? You can you can understand it the Rwandan genocide in um, in 1994, right? And it's an inter 1994 is an interesting moment in African history because you have Mandela, <laughs> you know, Mandela becomes the president of South Africa, so it's this big moment. On the other hand, you have the genocide. Um, but but, it, but it's, it's, it's trying to understand things that, I, that, that maybe in fiction I have more time to explore. Uh, but the whole idea of eventually 
the, the, the genocide is very, very personal, right? It's one neighbor waking up and killing another neighbor, you know, people who have been friends and, you know, for, you know, for, you know, for a very long time. So with, with the poetry, I'm, I'm trying to explore that hand, that hand that lifts up a machete to kill somebody they have known for a very long time. Uh, but, 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 yeah, but, 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 you know, but, but now also love, you know, as well. Um, you know, this, I, I can see a progression in my poetry, right, from uh, political, um, political poetry to more introspective, right? And, and, and part of it is, yeah, like, like how, how do you explore, you know, when my daughter was born, right, you know, she was born into my hands, you know, I'm the one who cut her umbilical cord, right? Though, of, of course, the mother then will have her own story. <laughs> I'm not trying to take that story away from her. But, yeah, but, but how, how, how do you capture that? And, and like, that, like, like that moment, you can only capture it through poetry. Yeah, so, 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 so I, 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 do, I do write, quote-unquote, literary fiction, uh, but I also write crime fiction. And, uh, and, and, and part, part of it for me was, in, in, in fact, Nairobi Heat, Nairobi Heat is dedicated to David Mailu and uh, Major Mwangi, who are two, you know, crime fiction, crime fiction writers, or, I don't know, popular, popular fiction, right? And part of, part of it for me was exploring the question of why do we privilege one kind of literature over, over another, right? Um, but, but, also, but also recognizing how we grew up. You know, we grew up reading, yeah, we grew up reading these popular fiction writers. In fact, uh, in class, you'd find the, the David Mailu would have, David Mailu wrote these little books that were, I don't know, like, I don't know, pornography. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, very short and, and, you know, and so on and so forth. So often you'd find somebody with a, let's say, you know, we are reading Shakespeare, right? In class, you'd find somebody, you know, sneaking in a copy of David Mailu into the Shakespeare, right? Um, but part of it was also that um, for these crime writers or popular fiction writers, when people like my father, you know, the literary fiction writers were being jailed or, you know, sent off, you know, into exile or killed and so on and so forth, it's actually the popular fiction writers who kept the politics alive, right? You know, and part of it would be, you know, maybe somebody moving to Nairobi uh, and not finding a job and so on and so forth, right? So, so, so they, 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 they actually are the ones who carried these questions for us. And, and, and in my writing, Nairobi Heat, I, I was very conscious of that. I, 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 want, okay, I, I would say Nairobi Heat on my crime fiction is a thank you note, is a thank you note to those writers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so so yeah, so so the book I'm, I'm writing right now is uh, I call it, it, it it's uh, yeah somewhere between black and African, which is about the relationship between Africans and African Americans. But to write it, I, I've had to go through this journey that has actually I would say has been traumatizing, <laughs> you know, because part of it has been visiting slave castles. So I was in Ghana. I went to the, you know, to where the slaves were, you know, in the castles where the slaves were held. Um, I went to Zanzibar and visited a slave castle as well. Uh, I, in, in the U.S., I, I did like, like a three-week-long journey just visiting different spaces of, of slavery. Um, I, I would say, and maybe this is the poet in me, right, uh, thinking about that book, um, I, I would say I've come face to face with absolute evil. Like it, it's, an, it's an absolute, it's an absolute, you know, in, you know, if you think of absolute in, I don't know, in quantum physics, <laughs> it, it, it really is uh, an absolute evil um, that I guess I'm trying to animate. So, so yeah, so, so hopefully I, I'm almost done uh, with the book. And, and of, of course, even the structure has been very difficult, you know, because of, of, of how do you, like, how do you tell a story um, like, how do you cover a story out of something that's already an absolute, in this case, an absolute evil? Yeah, so, but, but, but yeah, but I'm looking forward to going back to fiction, <laughs> you know, because then I, 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 maybe it's, it's, it's actually safer in fiction, right? You know, so I'm looking forward to going back to fiction and, of course, also poetry as well.
Yeah, so I, I, I would say, uh, um, I would say there's, there's a pre-pandemic uh, answer to that question and a post-pandemic, okay, not post, but current pandemic, right? Um, what, what has, I, I think the pre-pandemic, it was more, yeah, you go, you teach, you know, you make a few jokes with the students, right? <laughs> you know, they come to your office hours, you know, it's routine, right? It was routine, then you're just done, then you, you know, you continue on. Um, but I think the pandemic has changed the class dynamics to where now uh, both student and teacher have to respond to each other as human beings, right? You know, and, and I've actually been thinking about this a lot, you know, in a way, okay, Paulo Freire, right? Paulo Freire in Pedagogy of the Oppressed and his idea of teaching, right? Yeah, but teaching, it's, it's, it's a humane act, right? So I, I think the post-pandemic, okay, continuing pandemic has made that very, very visible. Um, so, I, yeah, so I, I would say I'm a different teacher now. I, I think I relate to my students now as human beings and hopefully they as well, <laughs> hopefully they as well see me as a human being. And, 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 and I think teaching from that, from that shared space of, uh, of vulnerability um, is where we should have always have been, right? Yeah, but yeah, but it's interesting because, you know, and I, I actually tell more stories now. You know, you know, I, I tell more stories in my classes. I talk about my own life. You know, the students will talk about their lives and what's happening. You know, in relation to, of course, uh, the scholarly. You know, this, you know, the pedagogy and yeah, the scholarly work. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. So I, I would say I teach as a human being now. <laughs> uh, yeah.